Hi everyone, and thank you so much for joining another episode of our Expert Edition webinar series. Um, so just a quick bit of background uh, and admin before we start. Uh, first of all, thank you for completing those questions at the beginning. Um, we'll be running through those answers shortly. Um, just so you know, you're all on mute for now. We will be having a 15 minute live Q&A session at the end. Uh, so you can either hold your questions until then, or you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A button. So you can put your question in here. If you do see a question in the Q&A that you'd also like the answer to, then please give it a thumbs up, as then it will be brought to the top and we can answer it for you. So today we have a very unique topic for you and one that we are all very excited about, which is the potential use of Calisim for hair care. Presenting this topic will be Dr. Sophie Schotter and Kelly Morell. Dr. Schotter is a full member of the British College of Aesthetic Medicine and ACE. She sits on the faculty for the International Association for Prevention of Complications in Aesthetic Medicine, while also being a key opinion leader for several leading aesthetic brands, including Allegan, through their mentorship program. Kelly Morell is a qualified scalp micropigmentation technician anesthetic practitioner who founded Scalp Confidential, one of London's leading hair loss clinics. She has won several industry awards for outstanding customer service. So without further ado, I'd like to pass over to Dr. Sophie Schotter and Kelly Morell. Dr. Schotter? And Kelly, are you there? Sorry, it wouldn't let me unmute no my <laughs> There we go. Over to you. <laughs> so the it disappeared where I normally unmute. So hi, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, so yes, as um, um, as Laura just mentioned, I'm um, an aesthetic doctor with um, a clinic in Kent, and I also work in London regularly. And Kelly and I have known each other for a long time and our journey into hair, our interest in hair kind of happened alongside each other, didn't it, Kelly? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's lovely to know you and to work with you. And it is, it's a very exciting, I think, hair's see, since I first got involved, it's grown so much, it really has. Yeah, and um, we'll come on a little bit onto um, some of the forecasted um, growth in hair. So my internet is being a little bit juddery, I'm afraid. So let's see if I can get it. So yeah, so why hair? Um, so a glamour survey in 1993, as far back as that, showed that 50% of all women experience hair loss at some stage in their life. The Mintel report tells us that hair loss is the biggest aesthetic concern for men. And from a commercial perspective, the hair loss treatment market is worth $3.8 billion in the US in 2020 and has continued growth forecasted through to 2024. And from an emotional perspective, I think this statement speaks for most women. <laughs> I don't know many women who um, who don't feel their confidence is linked in some way with their hair. And for men, it's even though it's maybe deemed as more socially acceptable um, that they go through some hair loss. For a woman, it's um, it's not necessarily seen as normal. Um, for um, I'm going to see if my video will hold. For a man, it's um, it's something that really um, enormously affects confidence. So let's see if it's, it's skipping through my slides very, very slowly. There. So um, a little bit of anatomy about the hair. So the hair is composed of two parts, the follicle, which is beneath the surface of the skin and is the living bit of the hair, and the hair shaft, which is dead and fully keratinized and is what we can see above the surface of the skin um, and the hair follicle actually acts as a reservoir of stem cells um, which as we age um, stop um, that pool is depleted and they actually become skin so our follicles become fewer and further between contributing to hair thinning um, sorry it's being very slow 
from my end moving slides here. So within Callisim, we have um, we talk about two types of stem cells, the mesenchymal and the epithelial stem cells. Hopefully it's going back. And these are the two types of stem cells which are found within the hair follicle. So a little bit about the hair cycle when it moves on to my next slide. <laughs> so the anagen phase, so at any point in time, we have between 80 and 150,000 hairs on our scalp. And the anagen phase is the one which most of our hairs are in. 85 to 90% of hairs at any one point are in anagen phase. And that can last from two to six years. We have a transition phase, the catagen phase, which is about 1% of hairs. Um, and then the telogen phase, which lasts on average three to four months, is the resting phase. Um, and when we talk about telogen effluvium, it's because the hair is shedding um, at that point in the cycle. It's the resting phase where there's hair going on, growing, sorry. Um, and when... Um, when we notice um, hair shedding after, for example, an extreme diet, um, we um, know that that's because the nutrition isn't reaching the follicle in that stage. There are many, many different causes of hair loss and family history is very important. Um, so it's something always to start with. Medical conditions such as diabetes um, can cause um, hair to fall out. Hormones, both thyroid and also um, testosterone can drive hair loss in men and um, menopause in women are all important. So I think hormone profiling can be very, very helpful. Medications, it's important to take a thorough medication history. And then things like stress and nutrition can also drive hair loss as well as smoking. So um, smoking, we think by affecting the circulation to the scalp. Radiation therapy can cause um, hair to fall out and hair styling as well. And it, it's crucial to really understand that's something called traction alopecia, what the causes of the hair loss, because um, in some cases that may not be reversible. Um, so we call those scarring alopecias. Here we go. So how do we assess hair loss? We use the Norwood scale in men, sorry. <laughs> Oh, I don't know why it's being so awkward to control from my end. <laughs> um, here. here we go. So we use the Norwood scale in men and um, the Ludwig scale in women. And it's, um, it's a very useful tool to document what stage of hair loss they're at and whether non-surgical techniques will be helpful for them. So how do we assess our patients? We do a thorough consultation. I do think consultation and examination is where we get a lot of clues as to what's going on. And as part of that consultation in our clinic, um, Kelly uses her dinoscope and she'll actually look close up at the health, at the health of the scalp um, and do a hair count as well. We do blood profiling. So we look at vitamin D, B12, folate, um, iron we do a full blood count to check for anemia um, and I think that's really important to look at because you'd be astonished how many people have a suboptimal level of one vitamin or another and that if you if you don't address that then you may be negatively you may be jeopardizing your chance of actually achieving results with the treatment you recommend for them so it's important to have them optimized from a nutrition level and we've also been doing DNA testing, um, which is very interesting and a new new development, which helps us to guide what the right potential treatment for a patient might be. So what are their key drivers of hair loss? Now, what we've been doing um, with our treatment protocol, um, and we've used this on men and women, in preparation, we ask patients to come with no hairstyling products on and to wash their hair with chlorhexidine shampoo on the day of treatment. Um, we do a treatment with the Callison Professional Serum and either a derma stamp or a microneedling device. We do six sessions a week apart. Um, aftercare, no washing, touching or styling for 24 hours. And we recommend a particular revitalizing shampoo to use between sessions. Um, and we found because the 
the sessions are relatively close together, the compliance is high. Um, people don't struggle to find that time in their routine. Sorry, I'm just trying to play this video. So this video just shows Kelly um, actually doing the treatment. So she stamps with the device and then drips the callosum over the area. So um, through the little um, micro wounds created by the microneedling device, um, she is um, delivering the callosum. Sorry, waiting for the next slide to load. <laughs> Thanks, I don't know why it's not doing it from my end. <laughs> Fingers crossed here. So we know that callosum causes, um, oh, <laughs> here. Um, increased epidermal proliferation and cell turnover. They get 42% more skin cell growth at seven days. And this has been tested using aged keratinocytes and fibroblasts. Now, um, the hair follicles are still sitting in skin. So um, the stimulation of um, the surrounding skin, the hair follicle itself, and, um, and um, the extracellular matrix is very, very important. Sorry, just skipping on to the next slide, hopefully. There. Um, and we also know that um, from callosum studies, oh, that um, we get up to a 600% increase in the thickness of the skin. So it shows just how stimulatory um, callosum is. It's really um, a very, very powerful tool to be using. So I'm going to hand on to Kelly, who's going to talk you through a few patient case studies that we've been um, working on. Just see if I can... See if it's... <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Can I take over? Hopefully. Um, if I can... If it'll move for me, if not, I might have to ask one of you to move them on for me as we go along, if that's okay. Um, it said click to start, which I've done. So let's see. Um, so we've had a great deal of success actually treating people with um, known underlying health issues such as low vitamin D, B12, iron, etc., or um, on medication. But I wanted to try and we wanted to try and sort of um, pick some people that were sort of as similar as possible in um, as in no underlying health conditions and um to show you all around so the first gentleman is a 36 year old male um no underlying health conditions or his test results come back fine um i've the in the dinoscope image um you can see the red dots are the hair count now his, I have counted the hairs, his hair count um, are 52 um, on the top, on the crown, and left-hand side at the front, 42 and 36. His miniaturized hairs are about 18 out of 52. Now on, if we can go to the next slide, please. I don't seem to have control, sorry. Um, Due to COVID-19, I haven't been able to do follow-up on everybody, um, not a clinical picture, but this is his before and after photo um, at five weeks only. So we would expect to see an increase in hair count or at least a decrease in miniaturized hairs. Um, that is on the fifth week before the sixth treatment. If we could go further along one, please. This is another patient. Um, he's um, a Asian male of 36 years of age, 
So again, I wanted to try and give you a, a parallel comparison. Um, again, no underlying health conditions. Um, this is his hair count at the top and the crown before treatment. If we could go further along, please. Thank you. And again, this is on the fifth treatment before, so I'm just moving over our photos of the way. Um, this is the treatment on, after the fifth treatment before the sixth. Now I've worked quite a lot with mesotherapy serums and products and I would never tell a, a client to expect anything before three months. Um, but what was really remarkable about these people is that the, the, the difference you can see already after just five weeks, I think was really quite something. You can see the hair growth is significantly improved. Um, the hair in everyone I've treated appears um, thicker and stronger, shinier. Um, and of course, going back to what Dr. Sophie was saying about the psychological impact, they have all saying having less scalp visible has given them a lot more confidence. That's the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so having shown you two male patients of a similar age, um, I wanted to show you a lady, again, no underlying health conditions. She's 64. She has been through a year of exceptional stress, um, which may have contributed to, to her hair sort of quality going down. Um, and she's had a head injury, which was about, I think, three or four years ago um, on one side. So again, maybe the trauma, the stress, but no known health conditions. Her blood tests come back fine. Um, and this one, I actually do have follow-up results, which is really something. Um, you can see in the left-hand side was the, the end of July, 2019. And in the follow-up, which was the 3rd of uh, December, the hair count had gone up from 37 to 42. And the miniaturization had decreased. So the amount of hairs that were struggling and weak um, had decreased and the calcium um, it seems has helped to strengthen them and to help improve the hair growth. Can we have the next one, please? Thank you. So this is before in July last year on the 3rd of December. And then a follow up we did in February just before COVID-19 um, shut the world down. Um, and you can really see that the decrease in weak struggling hairs as basically improved by about 26%, 28%, and the number of hairs has increased. And if we could go forward one more, please. This is how it looks to the eye. Again, hair appears shinier, healthier, thicker. Um, from a female perspective, it sits better. She said styling it is, is easier, is better. Um, all, all the clients we've had, Say that it, it just is easier to maintain their hair um, and also with the brushing less um, hairful um, and it just shows even though I haven't got the dinoscope follow-up photos of everybody yet I think it shows just through the before and after results with the naked eye that the hair growth has really significantly improved. I think if you can go one more please that that's yeah questions. Amazing. Thank you so much. Those pictures are incredible. Um, really, sorry for really the are. slight um, technical difficulties. <laughs> okay, thank <laughs> you for moving the live webinar. Um, so we will start with the questions. We've got some questions in the Q&A box and then we'll move live to the floor. So everyone watching, you'll notice at the bottom there's a raise hand button. So if you do have a question, you can click that and then you'll be prompted to unmute your microphone and you can ask. Dr. Schotter and Kelly, uh, your question directly. Um, but we'll start here. So there was one question that was asking for, so the exact protocol, as you might mention, just of how, what you did with the treatment, what you told the patient to do when you applied the serum. Um, so we, you go Kelly. <laughs> no, no, go, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 you go for it, don't worry. <laughs> um, we, um, as, as Dr. Sophie was saying earlier, just tell them to come in with um, clean, dry hair, no products in, 
Um, I do also, especially with anyone like ladies dyeing their hair, to not dye the hair about a week before treatment and wait until two weeks after treatment. So there is a change in a lot of um, the before and after photos, the look of the hair. Normally you can see some greys coming through. Um, and again, as Dr. Sophie was saying, the compliance is easy normally within sort of a six week period. It doesn't go on for too long. Sorry, Sophie, Dr. Sophie, I'll let you go ahead. No, that's exactly what I was going to say. It's, yeah, just the six sessions a week apart. I actually think the aftercare is quite important as well because we had one particularly interesting patient, didn't we, who um, just presented with um, a couple of days after treatment with almost looked a bit like a folliculitis. And the only thing we could attribute it to was that actually um, he'd used his dirty comb almost immediately after treatment. So we know that callosin promotes very, very quick healing of those micro wounds, but he used a comb literally straight away. Um, and so again, we've on the back of that, we've asked people just not to, not to even brush or comb their hair after treatment, just go home as it is um, and leave it until the next day. Okay, amazing. Yep. Um, someone else was asking what depth of needling you did for those patients. We did, well, all of those patients we did, um, I, I did completely different depths. So um, the lady was um, 0.8, one of them was uh, one millimetre, um, and one was two. But they're, they're all different. I treat patients of all different depths, depending on if it's front at the back, their hair loss, severity etc and their and their tolerance because then, um, actually what what's what can be really interesting is sometimes the ones that you think should hurt don't hurt <laughs> and the ones that should be very very tolerable and manageable pain wise can be more uncomfortable so it just shows people's experience of pain is so variable um so we want it to be deep enough that they're going to get results but um not agony for them Okay, so do you have any experience with areata alopecia? I haven't got any long-term follow-up photos as yet. I have treated a couple. Um, again, early results were little fluffy hairs were growing through, but I haven't, again, due to COVID-19, I haven't got long-term follow-up. Um, mm -hmm. Happy to share when I do, with their permission, of course. Okay. So we've got quite a few questions here asking how long the results last for and then when a treatment, a sort of a retreatment is advised. So like anything, um, treatments need maintenance. Um, and so after the initial course of treatment, we will always come up with a maintenance plan for them. But as shown with the um, lady that um, Kelly showed the photos of, that improvement in hair count and hair quality, um, that was at about nine months. So generally we're, we're recommending about six monthly for a maintenance, aren't we Kelly? Do you, yeah. do you ever recommend more frequent than that? Um, not, as yet, I think six months for a top up treatment is, is ideal. I suppose it depends again on the underlying cause. If they're on, you know, a medication through a, an underlying health condition, which is their side effect is causing them the hair loss, then, you know, maybe once every three months might be more useful for them. I think it's, you know, treating each patient in front of you at the time. But yeah, once every six months, I think is ideal. So your average, your average person once every six months should be spot on. Okay. Um, also, quite a few people have asked how much serum you use per treatment per patient. Um, again, it, it depends on the size of the area. So with some people that I've treated, if I'm doing all across the top to the crown, I'll use almost all of it in the one session. Um, if we're just doing a, a tiny bit of the crown or a little bit at the front, um, then I'll use maybe, I don't know, two mils and then give them the rest. The bottles come with a little pipette. So then they will use it 
for the following three days and keep putting it on. They go home with it. And then for, so this kind of links in, recommended at-home care for patients after the treatment. So you would say the serum as well? And so, so the products that um, I tend to recommend um, to apply to the scalp in between treatments, it, it, it's just, um, there's a product range called Aesthetic Dermal and they have a scalp fit shampoo and a Revitalix shampoo. And the scalp fit is a chlorhexidine shampoo so they can wash on the morning of treatment. And compared with many of the sort of other brands we tried, the, these feel like a nice shampoo to use. So, but they're still good for boosting scalp health. So that's the only one I recommend. How about you, Kelly? Um, yeah, no, the same again. I've, it's, it's really hard. Um, the thing I really do, I've had to recommend to a few people is to um, stop or at least reduce until emergencies dry shampoo. It's really <laughs> been causing a lot of inflammation. And one thing I forgot to mention about the, um, the lady when I, I showed you the, the three diner, um, the, dinoscope slides together she had some inflammation around the follicles which actually didn't return on the longer term follow-up um, it remained under control and was fine and we think it was a dry shampoo that may have been causing that I don't know um, it didn't return see Palacin's done something but the aesthetic care shampoo they actually do a really good conditioner as well it's I've tried it myself and I, I really liked it okay um, this is an interesting question. So based on your studies with the scalp, um, can the treatment work for eyebrow growth as well? Or is that, is it just the scalp that you focused on? Personally, I haven't um, done it yet. <laughs> um, have you treated anyone with eyebrows yet, Dr. Sophie? No, I've, I've used it for, um, for, I mean, I guess in principle, if you, that, the issue again is there is the delivery. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, could we microneedle over an eyebrow? I guess possibly if they haven't got any micropigmentation going on there. Um, I haven't tried it. Um, I don't know anecdotally whether anyone's noticed it with some of the topical home care callicin products though, whether anyone's actually, is that something you've heard of, Laura, where people using the callicin skincare? Um, have noticed anything? Not particularly. I mean, some people have with eyebrows, we've had one that sort of it can stimulate growth, but I mean, yeah, nothing that we've actually published no. yet. So, yeah. I might do it myself, I think. I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, I have yeah really there's an no idea. And they don't grow any more than this, so I'll, um, I'll, I'll try it myself. <laughs> Okay, so we also have, what we'll do actually, we'll go live to the floor. So if anyone does have a question, if you just click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen, um, then you can ask the question live. Okay, so we have Safida here. Should be prompted to unmute your microphone and then should work. Okay. Have you ever used it in treating alopecia areata? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. I think that was the same one as earlier. So treating an alopecia areata. Um, yes, again, I've treated some of the, the patches. I haven't got any long-term follow-up um, yet due to not being able to follow up. Um, initially, they were very soft baby hairs growing through. Um, one lady for the first time in, in a couple of years, but I, I, I can't share any more than that with you right now, unfortunately. Okay, so now we have Mark Hoazjo. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, do you have any recommendation to your patients who live in an area with very hot water, which unfortunately accelerate hair loss, I mean, may you saw ruin the good treatment that you have? Um, Dr. Sophie? 
So it, it's not something um, I routinely, I mean, I routinely advise patients about, but there are, I know there are shower heads um, available now that actually filter the water. Um, mm. So um, that technology does exist now. I think if I thought it was, um, I've act actually, my hairdresser even sells them in London. So yeah, I don't tend to see hair patients in London. So it's not a problem I've noticed um, in my neck of the woods in Kent, particularly. Um, but if it were a concern for a specific patient, I'd recommend one of these shower heads. Actually, I do have one and they are very good, even just for general skin conditions. Yeah. Mm, very good. Thank you. Okay, so we've got another question here um, asking if you use an anaesthetic prior to the treatment. No. Um, applying anaesthetic to the scalp can be messy um, and actually it might take the edge off but my experience has been it doesn't actually make a significant difference um, whether that's because when someone still has hair on their head to actually get it over enough of the scalp to make a difference is just almost impossible um, but we find the treatments really well tolerated um, our threshold to um, I mean, Kelly, we don't really tend to get much above five out of 10, do we, on most people? No, no. And I think it is, uh, it's a tolerance no. thing because the, the five out of 10 I got was on a, a sort of a one millimeter um, depth. And I've had a sort of two out of 10 when treating someone on a 1.5 millimeter depth. So it, I think it's just personal tolerance. Um, so yeah, we, we don't routinely use anaesthetic, we just tailor it to tolerance. And what we do know is that across the scalp, the hair follicles are at different depths. Mm -hmm. So they're not at the same depth everywhere. Um, and so I don't believe there's one necessarily one magic number um, at which is perfect to deliver. Okay, so Luca, you've been unmuted. Hi, good morning from Italy. Hi, thank you very much. Hi, Dr. Sophie. Hi, Gilly. Uh, I want to know any information um, uh, about the use of the colosim in, um, in a hair, uh, hair brown uh, regrow, if you have any experience in hair browns. No, neither of us has to date used it on anyone for eyebrows, but Kelly will trial it on herself, <laughs> um, but yeah, so so far, no. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got another question asking about uh, what you used in particular for the treatment, so a derma roller, a stamp or a pen. Um, it can be any of them. I think whatever microneedling device you have in the clinic, um, you could use. Generally, a roller, I think, is really very painful for most people, and I'm not a big fan. So I tend to stick to, uh, we've used stamps and we've got a good pen as well. So um, my personal preference tends to be for a pen, because um, again, you're if it's automated, the number of micro injuries you cause is greater than if you're doing it manually. Um, so I think, and I also think a good pen for comfort just can't be beaten. Yeah. Okay, and then how do you judge the depth needed for microneedling? So you say that you vary it depending on patient. Is it just patient tolerance or? Um, it, patient tolerance and also, the where it is you can go that little bit i and you can go a little bit deeper at the back and not at the front just purely because the scalp is is thinner at the front than at the back um but as dr sophie rightly said you know there you haven't got even uh spaced out lined follicles so you know <laughs> Um, and there are there are bits of the scalp, for example, we know that the um, scalp at the um, crown of the head is far thicker than the scalp um, in the temporal region. So um, things like that are anatomically a bit more predictable. Okay. 
Um, so this lady says that she had a patient who had a hair transplant in Turkey prior to COVID-19. Um, she was planning a course of PRP treatment. How would this compare? Okay, so PRP, um, I do offer. Um, and I guess my experience with PRP has been that the results can be really variable. And I use a very, very good um, machine um, that provides a very high platelet yield. But um, the quality of my platelets will be different to the quality of your platelets. Um, and my platelets will be different today depending on whether I had a glass of wine last night or not. And so there are so many factors that can influence PRP, whereas with a vial of callosum, I know what I'm getting in the vial and um, I find its behaviour may be more predictable. And that's been my, um, my personal preference has been for um, using callosum. They're both going to be stimulatory um, and the PRP is very good if people um, only want something that comes from them. So if people are very, very picky about natural treatments, then sometimes PRP is something they'll accept over other things. Um, but for me, it makes up a relatively small part of my practice. Okay. So did you notice a difference in hair pigmentation following the treatment? This is an interesting one, Kelly. <laughs> um, so we did, yes. Um, I have no idea why, whether um, that's over to the, the science team behind it and Dr. Sophie, but um, I, I really did. Uh, whether that is just by chance, whether there's more dorm dormant follicles um, that wouldn't have been grey that are being stimulated. I, I don't know. <laughs> but yes, we did. Okay. So do you have any experience with radiofrequency microneedling um, with callosum for hair restoration? No. Um, radiofrequency microneedling, there are some great devices out there, but um, I had one for a while um, and um, I found my patients found it very difficult to tolerate. We do have a venous viva, which is um, it's pins rather than deeper needles. Um, I haven't used it for hair, um, but we do use it for skin. And again, callosum afterwards is fantastic for helping speed up the healing. Okay. Um, let me have a look. Okay, so have you used thulium or erbium glass laser instead of using a derma roller stamp or pen? No, no? I, I don't personally work with any lasers. Um, so no, there are many different ways of breaching the skin barrier. Um, and this is, um, for me, the thing with um, microneedling is I guess we have some control over the depth we're at. Um, but no, there are many different ways, be that with plasma shower, um, be that with, with lasers um, that you can breach the skin barrier and therefore get delivery of the callosum. Okay. Um, another question here. Can you treat thin hair with it? Yes, 100%. Um, any, any type of, of hair loss. Um, but so long as there is hair there to still treat. Um, and the sooner, if it's thin hair or if it's hair that's starting to show... Um, that it's starting to thin and get weaker and struggle, then the sooner one starts treating, the better. Okay. And then someone was asking about, so with the serum, do you microneedle it in? So apply it before and then microneedle, or do you just apply it after the treatment? We apply it after. So create the little micro injuries first and then um, apply the serum and rub it in. Okay. It's a very um, 
it's very light. It's not an oily serum. So there's no, um, not that we would need glide, but there isn't anything there. You, you would just want to, to drop it on straight away. Um, does callosum help to grow dormant follicles or must the hair follicle be present for it to grow? So if a hair follicle um, is dead, it's dead. Nothing you do will revitalize that hair follicle. So um, it will only, only work if that hair follicle is viable. So in advanced hair loss, short of a hair transplant, there often aren't any other options. So it just depends on... Um, so this is why also understanding a medical history and the cause of the hair loss is so important because there are some conditions that it just wouldn't help. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then last question we'll go for is, uh, can you use it with minoxidil? Um, there's no reason why not, um, as in, um, if they were using it, I just would say not to apply it before or after the day of treatment. Um, we haven't, I haven't got any direct comparisons to not using it. The, the people that I treat personally are, have either used minoxidil and have decided to stop through one, you know, through one reason or another. Um, I don't know, Dr. Sophie, is there anything? Me for me this is where the dna testings become so useful because actually um it really as part of our consultation process now we recommend that they have that and it will guide you as to whether minoxidil or whether finasteride utasteride um are likely to work for your hair loss or whether treatments like callosum um, might work better and or whether it's um, more likely to be nutrient related. So it basically tells us the key drivers of that hair loss and therefore we can determine which treatments have a better chance of working. So for me, if someone came on minoxidil and hadn't had the sort of results they wanted, I would recommend doing that to guide whether or not there would be any point in staying on it. Okay. Is that fair, Kelly? Yeah, no, that's normally exactly the reason that the patients that I treat, they're, they're not on it because they've normally been on it for a considerable amount of time, haven't yeah. seen a great different, a great deal of difference or, or did, and then it got to like a, a plateau where they didn't see anything further. Um, so again, yeah, that's when we would do consultation, bloods, try a test and then treat. Yeah, exactly. Okay, amazing. Thank you both so much for coming online. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for joining. Hopefully we answered um, lots of your questions. Any that we haven't answered, we will compile together and email you out. So um, you'll get the answers to those. Um, so our next webinar will be with Dr. Lisa Learn on the 28th of May. Um, there'll be an email going out to register for this. We'd love for you all to join that. Um, as always, there's a feedback form at the end. So we'd love to hear how you found it and we will see you all very soon. Thank you again both so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.